I've decided I'm going to go into Genesis. And uh, the great thing about Genesis is Jesus Christ is on every page, so we're going to attempt to see that. Uh, Jesus is pictured in types, in shadows, in figures, in prophecy, uh, in allegory. And uh, the Christian life is also prefigured in many ways in Genesis. Genesis is the book of seeds. Revelation is the harvest. All the seeds of the divine revelation are planted in Genesis and then develop throughout all the scriptures and end up in Revelation with the full result. The New Jerusalem is the final result of everything God started in Genesis. And it's the New Jerusalem is the greatest sign in the Bible. And it it has all the major themes that start in Genesis ending up there. It's really interesting. You can trace all the major themes of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, from the Garden to the New City Jerusalem. And uh, so it's really profound and it's very edifying. Um, and I thought, well, I'll start at the creation of man because I really don't want to get bogged down into debates about cosmology. Um, but I think I will quickly go through Genesis 1, um, presenting a little of, you know, where I'm coming from. But still, the purpose is to see Jesus Christ. I'm not really interested in old earth versus new earth, flat earth versus round earth st stuff, you know. Gen Honestly, I used to listen to Chuck Missler all the time. He kind of lost me when he got to his Genesis study. Um, because he spent, like, oh, I don't know, hours and hours and hours talking about physics and the stretching of the earth and all that, you know, the stretching of the universe and the quant quantizing of redshift and all this stuff. And I was just like, I don't care. <laughs> uh, I benefited more from, uh, probably there's a couple books I benefited greatly from, um, Watchman Nee's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, Witness Lee's Life Study of Genesis, which focused on how these figures in Genesis really show us types of how God deals with us in Christ. It's, and that's how I, I see it. For me, it's very edifying stuff. Um, now, don't get me wrong. I love Chuck Missler when he gets past it, but I, I just... He, he, I was not into his science stuff. I was really into types, prophecies, how the Bible is designed. You know, when you see that from Genesis to Revelation, it's all a singular set of themes that span all these scriptures with a consistent language, consistent metaphors, consistent comparisons, consistent allegories, consistent use of words... It's amazing because that's where Chuck Missler always said, you know, here we have 66 books written over thousands of years by more than 40 authors in three different languages, and yet we find it is an integrated message system written from beyond our time domain in which every detail evidences supernatural design. And he just, he could show that, that was his gift, was to show us how powerfully put together the scripture is to prove it is supernaturally designed. And Genesis, all the different types and everything, really defines the vocabulary for the Bible. Uh, there's a principle called the law of first mention, which is that typically the first use of a word will govern its context um, throughout the scripture and define it. And, for example, the first use of the word sin is with Cain and Abel, as we'll see when we get to Genesis 4. And it's pictured as a lion crouching to devour him. It is, principle, it, it, it is pictured as a principle more powerful than Cain that acts even without his deciding to do something. Uh, sin is presented first as a principle before it's even itemized into transgressions in the Bible. Uh, 
And that brings us like to Romans 7, for example, the law of sin in my members. Um, love, the first use of the word love that we talk about is when God told Abraham, take your only son who you love and sacrifice him. And even in the language, uh, your only son, we know Ishmael was his other son. He didn't, Isaac wasn't his only son, but God crafted the language so that Abraham ends up acting out a type of the father's love who loved the world so that he gave his only begotten son, right? Um, as an offering for us on that same mount. And Abraham knew he was acting out prophecy. We know from Romans 5, God commends his love for us and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. And 1 John says, in this is love, not that we loved him, but that he loved us and gave his son for us as a propitiation for our sins. Well, that's pictured back in the first use of the word love in the Bible. So that's the law of first mention. Melchizedek shows up for the first time in Genesis. And we can look at all of the things about him and see a beautiful type of Christ in his high priesthood and get principles of how Christ ministers us from a place of victory after the spoil has been taken. And he brings us bread and wine, you know, bringing us into his victory, actually. Uh, so many things like that. So first mention and then expositional constancy. There's a law of first mention, which is the first use of a word or a theme where it first emerges typically governs the definitions around it. Then expositional constancy is that that principle will be carried throughout the scriptures. And so we learn that there is a consistent vocabulary throughout the Bible, whether you're talking about gold or silver or incorruptible things. You know, we talked in Peter, we talked a lot about the incorruptible things. How do we know that when Paul is talking about building with wood, hay, and stubble versus building with gold, silver, and precious stones, how do we know that gold is the faith in the divine nature? How do we know that silver is related to redemption? And how do we know that precious stones is related to transformation and the building up of the habitation of God? Well, from the whole scripture, God uses language consistently throughout the scripture. And that's where the design is breathtaking. Because again, 40, uh, 66 books written over thousands of years by more than 40 authors in three different languages from all stations of life, people who did not know each other, but all had visitations from God himself who told them what to write. No scripture is a private interpretation. No prophecy is of private interpretation. Holy men of old wrote as they were moved upon by God. And they used consistent language all the way through the scripture to speak of the same things. And that's how we know these things. We search the scriptures. And the way God designed things is there's not a single chapter on any doctrine of the Bible. The major doctrines are not established in one chapter. They're sprinkled through the whole message system. So that you have to be a diligent student looking at the entirety of Scripture, the whole counsel of God's Word, to understand the themes. Baptism, if you want to understand baptism, you have to look at the flood. And you have to look at the decree that God made there concerning man, his judgment of man, the end of the human race. You have to look at what a good conscience is and how Noah represents that. We talked about that in Peter. You have to look at Paul, who says we are baptized into the death of Christ. And you have to look at how the cross, there was a garden. Uh, it, it was The cross actually was in the garden where there was a tomb, where Jesus was buried. And you have to see that it's a kind of planting, that he was a seed, right? Uh, being planted in the earth in his death, in that garden tomb. And we were planted in there with him. And we came, emerged from his resurrection as his multiplication. All that is in baptism. How do we know all, how, how can we relate all those things to baptism? Well, it's because we look at the entirety of scripture to get our clue, not just verses out of context or one, like as if Peter is written apart from the rest of the Bible. 
or Paul has written apart from the rest of the Bible. We look at the whole Bible to understand it. And so it's here, there, here a little and there a little. And I was talking to somebody on the wall today who's like, you know, I've been trying to understand our death with Christ. I just don't see it. I, it's hard for me to understand it. And we we're talking about the word. And he was getting kind of frustrated because it's kind of hard to understand. And I said, look, the way this is written is that the word is designed to be interacted with again and again and again because the purpose is to bring you into fellowship with God through it and to wash and transform you on the journey. God is not so much interested in what you know, but in your being washed as you search and, and encounter him in the word. And he wants to be the word to you and he wants the word to be nourishing to you. And he has designed it in a way that you can't just read it like a textbook and get the answer. No, you really have to search the scriptures diligently with an honest heart and a good conscience before God with a spirit of prayer and a spirit of meekness and hunger in order to receive the understanding. You know, I looked at Romans 6 through 8 for five or six years before the light started really coming. I mean, I looked at it for 25 years, but really focused on it. Uh, before the, I really could start to see what it meant that I died with Christ. Now the light is shining more because there's more people speaking about it and it's easier and easier to understand. But the point is, spiritual understanding is not developed uh, without coming to the Word again and again and again and getting little bits at a time. And God orders your steps so that you're really not going to learn Him without Him interacting with you and dealing with you. <laughs> so that's why God did it this way. He designed it and also to protect the message system. You know, the great news is that the gospel is literally on every page. So if something were to happen to the Bible, which God has sovereignly protected it so it wouldn't, but if you take pages out or take chapters out or take whole books out, it doesn't dissolve the message. You've still got it in every part. Jesus is on everywhere. You cannot shut him up. <laughs> so... Uh, you lose a little resolution if you take some of the chapters out, but you can still understand it. So Genesis is like a great book just to, sh get, to show us a lot of these major themes, and I don't know how many of the themes we're going to get into, um, but my hope is that the Word really does become food for us, that we enjoy God through it. It brings us into fellowship with Him, and we see Jesus Christ. What else is there? There is nothing else to do. Uh, there's nothing else to pursue. Why read Genesis? Be, to know God. It, I hope that when you read the Bible, it is, I hope when I read the Bible, it is not just to come away knowing things. I want to know God. I want to fellowship with him through it. That's what keeps me going, is there's a taste of the sweetness of God in the word, you know. Um, okay, so coming to Genesis, like I said, I think I will have to, quickly go through Genesis 1, but I don't want to get bogged down into it. It is a book, uh, uh, Genesis 1 is a record either of creation or restoration, depending on how you look at it, with a focus not on cosmology, not on if the earth is flat or, or curved, not on physics, but on life. And the significant event happens in my view, on day three, when God brings the land out from the sea. Um, and that's when he starts causing life to come forth. And day three is the day of resurrection. So I think it's significant that God brought dry ground out of the waters of death on the day of resurrection on day third. Um, and let God and let the waters under heaven be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear and it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters was called seas and he said it was good. Uh, let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is upon it in itself. So the principle of life and multiplication upon the earth and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass 
an herb yielding seed after its kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed is in itself after its kind and God saw it was good and the evening and the morning were the third day. The third day is the day when life started happening. And it starts with the, the herbs and trees and the seed in themselves and the grass which gives the possibility for all the other life, right? But then you see an, in, a, um, an increasing complexity of life in terms of consciousness. First, grass and trees and herbs, which have the lowest kind of conf, con, consciousness. They don't even have a face, right? But then out of, uh, then you have the birds, okay? Um, once, well, actually, yeah, the birds and then the animals. So there's slightly higher consciousness. And then you have man, who supposedly is the highest consciousness, created in the image of God. All the other animals were created after their kind, but man was created in the image and likeness of God after God's kind. He's the only life that was created after another kind and adam was called a son of god but is that the highest life in the in the order no because the next life is represented by the tree of life god puts man in front of the tree of life and what life does that represent god's own life and so that is a picture of god's intention is that he wants to come into man as a kind of food what is God's intention in the whole universe? It is to work himself into man and become a part of man so that man becomes his expression and reigns as his representative. So for that reason, he created man in his image and gave him authority with his likeness and gave him dominion over everything. But we know the story. He didn't eat the tree of life. Instead, he ate the other tree and corrupted himself and corrupted his image so he was no longer in the image of god and yet god didn't take that authority away <laughs> so the earth has been corrupted ever since uh death has reigned sin has reigned man is corrupted in his image and needs to be recreated and what god does to recreate him is to send jesus christ to partake of flesh and blood like us, made a little lo lower than angels for the suffering of death, that he may test, taste death for every man, right? But then, in resurrection, he makes himself available again as food. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. What's God's intention? To put his life in man. And to, to be in man, the, to form man in his image and to maintain that image so that man is expressing not his own life, but God's life in his life. That's what God wants. That's what the sons of God are, ultimately. That's what Christ is. He is the God-man. And then we are born of God because we receive Jesus Christ, who is the tree of life. And God's life comes into us. And he brings us into the new creation, which is created in the knowledge of Christ, in true righteousness and holiness after his image, created the image of God. So we do have the image of God again restored in regeneration, in our spirit. And eventually our body will be transfigured as well. And then, but see, everything is earthly first and then heavenly. So man was created from the dust of the ground out of clay. And then he was uh, meant to express God on the earth and he's given dominion over the earth. That's the first man, Adam. But the second man from heaven, Christ, in resurrection, doesn't have authority just over the earth, but the heavens as well. He's been raised up. He's been exalted. He's been seated in the heavens far above everything in heaven and on earth, given a name above every name, right? Far above the principalities, far above the angels, at the right hand of God, there's a man there, as the representative head of a new humanity formed as he then comes to be the life of those who are members of his body. And that's us. 
who were also raised up together with him and seated with him in the heavens, and destined to be glorified with him, like unto his heavenly glory, to reign with him as heirs, not only of the earth, but the heavens as well. So first it's the natural, which we see in Genesis, and then it's the heavenly, which we see in Revelation. In Genesis, there's an earthly garden. In Revelation, there's a heavenly city, right? So again, there is this developing of a theme all the way through Scripture, uh, first in types that are set in natural settings on the earth, and then fulfilled in the reality that comes from heaven and remakes us in a heavenly way. So yes, it is a picture, like God breathing into Adam, creating his, him in his image and likeness, setting before the tree, the tree of life. All that's a picture, but it's an earthly picture with earthly implications. But we are heavenly, and the fulfillment for us is heavenly. It's not just God breathing into clay and making him alive and setting him before the tree of life so he can rule on earth. It's God in Christ having gone through incarnation, human living, death and resurrection, ascension, ascending to the heavens, glorified, deified, clothed in his divinity, and then coming. And when he comes to the disciples in John 20, he appears in the upper room without having entered a door, without needing to use anything of this physical creation to transport himself into that room. He just shows up. And yet he's flesh and bone, right? And what does he do? He breathes into them and says, receive you the Holy Ghost. And that was when the church was really born. We say that the church was born in Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit came down. But actually, I believe it was born, the regeneration occurred when those disciples received Christ, the life-giving Spirit, as he breathed himself into them. And that's analogous to when God breathed into Adam to make him alive. But instead of just becoming alive as men, they became alive as the sons of God. They became alive with the divine life, able to enter into the kingdom of God and partake of his affairs. Um, and we'll see all that. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but the focus on Genesis 1 is a focus of life. Uh, from uh, first bringing out the earth and setting up the dry ground so that life can be multiplied. And that being on the third day is a type of resurrection out of the tomb. He separated it from the waters. Now the waters, I believe, are a picture of judgment and death. Um, and the reason is because that's consistent throughout the scriptures. Uh, but I also believe that this is a, more of a, rest, a, a creation and a restoration account. Um, but that's just me. I mean, you don't have to embrace that. But in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was, now the word there is actually in the Hebrew, it's became. The word earth became without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Um, the darkness is never good. Throughout Scripture, darkness speaks of judgment. And what did God do? He said, let there be light, right? And there was light. Well, John points us to that and says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. Same was in the beginning with God. All things were created through him. Not Apart from him, not one thing that was made was made. And then he says, in him was life, and the life was the light of man. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness didn't overcome it. And John presents, John refers us back to the creation account to show that Christ is the reality. I mean, this is a picture, but Christ is the reality. Yes, God really created the heavens and the earth, and yes, there was darkness, and yes, he said light, but that speaking was his word, and that speaking is a person, which is Christ, and he is the light, and in him is life. The reason the light comes out is so that the life can come, and again, that's the focus in Genesis 1 is life. Light comes for life. Uh, 
But the earth being without form and void, if you do a scripture on that, that the Hebrew word is tohu vavohu. Uh, if you do a search for those words, you'll find it only appears a couple times, but it is mentioned whenever there is chaos and destruction due to a judgment from God. And he said in Isaiah, he did not create the world or the heavens and the earth. He, he did not create the earth a formless void, but to be inhabited. So that tells me that if I'm going to be consistent with the whole of scripture and he says he didn't create it that way, then to say that God created the heavens and the earth and then the earth became without form and void, something happened is more likely. That's more consistent with the whole revelation of scripture, that something happened between when God created the heaven and the earth and when it became without form and void. He didn't create it without form and void. He created it to be inhabited. What happened? And why was darkness on the face of the deep? Where did the deep come from? The deep there is the abyss. And the abyss, we know, is the habitation of demons and fallen angels, right? Uh, so the darkness speaks of judgment consistently throughout the scripture. Water is a type of judgment or life, depending on the context throughout the scripture. But typically, it's judgment when it comes to the judgment of God and, and for example, the flood, right? The waters of judgment passed over me. Uh, and darkness. So there's no light. Now, whether you want to believe that, see, a lot of people believe, this is called the gap theory, made uh, first kind of really made popular by G.H. Pember, I guess, or its earliest ages, but other people picked it up, Chuck Messler, a lot of the, a lot of, a lot of the people who take the Bible very literally um, adhere to the gap theory because it explains why Satan is called the god of this world, that he was, there was an original Garden of Eden, um, that where Lucifer walked upon the stones of fire, but then because iniquity was found with him, because of the multitude of his transgressions and his merchandising, he fell and was cast out of the holy mount. When was that? All right. Was that after the fall of man or before? Well, we know that when Adam and Eve were in the garden, there was already a negative element in there, represented by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And death was there, and sin was there, and Lucifer had fallen. He was already a, a serpent, a uh, Nakash, a uh, shining one, enchanter, and he already lied and sinned. He was sinning while he was lying to them, introducing them to death and sin. And God told them and warned them about death and sin. See, we got this idea that everything was perfect and there was no death. Um, but... According to the gap theory, darkness was already on the face of the earth and there was an abyss and judgment had happened. Some kind of catastrophic event took place here that, to, that is the source of negative things in Satan's kingdom. And man was created in response to the fall. Actually, it was God's original purpose, right? But from Satan's perspective, he had authority. Satan looks at this as his world. And yet, was it really his? No. It's God's, to give to whoever he wants. And he gave it to man. He created this clay man out of the dust of the earth. And gave him dominion, made him in his likeness and gave him dominion. And it was such an insult to the angels. And the angels said, uh, according to Hebrews, the angels were the ones that said, when I consider the works of your hands and marvel at your universe that you made, what is man that you are mindful of him? You made him lower than the angels, but you sent him over all the works of your hands? It doesn't even make sense. It's an insult. And God has always worked by the principle, according to Corinthians, of choosing the foolish things of this world and the things which are despised to confound the mighty and the strong. First, the angels. They're the first group to be offended by God's choosing of foolish things. <laughs> Um, and that was a partially a judgment and man will be instrumental. The, the heavenly man, the new creation, man, the new man, the man child will be instrumental in displacing Satan, not only from the earth, but the heavens as well. Um, right now, apparently he can go back and forth and accuse us before God and all that. 
But that's going to be put to an end when he's displaced by man who's been given the dominion. Uh, redeemed man, regenerated man, transformed man, glorified man, heavenly man, the new creation man will stand. And actually, when you really start digging into it, we literally become his replacement. Uh, and yet even have more than what any of the angels ever had because we're brought into God's heart and made one with him. That's what the tree of life represents. God himself coming into us. Uh, so this is just, you can say it's a theory. It's, this is something you can agree to disagree about. I still believe in a seven day creation model. Um, the sun and the stars were set in place after on the fourth day to set times and seasons. So day and night don't necessarily mean uh, well, we, we know a 24-hour period is dictated by the Earth's rotation in respect to the sun. But the sun and the stars were not put back or put into their place to govern times and seasons until the fourth day. So what governed the times and seasons for the first three days? Well, darkness and light, I guess. I don't know. I don't have all the answers. This is just a theory, okay? You don't have to believe it. You don't have to accept it. I just wanted you to know where I fall on that. And so after the judgment of the angels, whatever this former cataclysm was, then we have the earth plunged under darkness. And Peter mentions that the earth, which was then destroyed, standing in and out of the water, uh, and then talks about the earth that presently is. <laughs> It's kind of weird. So uh, just, you know, some mysterious things that it just comes from trying to be as literal as possible when reading the word. Um, but we know from John and Paul that this should have at least a spiritual overtone because Paul says God who shined light or called light out of darkness has shined in our hearts to illuminate the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ in 2 Corinthians 4. And then we already read from John, or I recited John, which shows that the light that comes into the world to shine upon the darkness and give life is Christ, the Word. And here we see God speaking. So at least, if that's how God created it, fine. If it's all just talking about the creation account, fine. But the point is that in a type, you can see that there's darkness and then the spirit broods right like a and the word there is like a mother hen uh and remember jesus said how long you know O jerusalem you slew the prophets you slew the uh those who sent to you he wept over jerusalem and he said how long i would have longed to how long i've longed to gather you as a chick gathers her hens and uh, here the spirit is portrayed in this way as hovering over the waters of the deep in a, uh, the, the Hebrew word in, is like hovering over eggs to incubate them for life. Then God calls light out of the darkness. And Paul says that this is kind of how God works with us. Our hearts were in darkness. We didn't understand Jesus Christ at all. Obviously, we didn't understand God's glory. We couldn't even see him. He was just a historical figure that we discarded and mocked. At least that's my life, you know. My heart was in darkness, but the Spirit was hovering over me. And I, there were so many people in my life, Christians that came in and out of my life, that I persecuted and caused to suffer and who responded with praying for me. What was that? That was the Spirit hovering over me through the church. And then eventually he incubated a softness in me that allowed for life and light to come forth. God shined. He called light out of darkness and shined in my heart to illuminate the knowledge of glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. All of a sudden, Jesus Christ was three-dimensional. He was risen. He was real. In my mind, I couldn't stop dealing with him. I had to contend with him. And that changed my life and caused me to be born of God. Because when the light comes, the life comes. And that was my 
eating of the tree of life. He made himself available to me as a kind of food. And ever since then has been, by the word, supplying me with himself as life and light. And that's true of all of us as believers. So that's how I like to look at this Genesis 1. Is because Paul and John use an allegorical spiritual approach, it does not void the literal. It, this is a literal creation account, okay? He literally created the earth and the heavens in seven days. I don't believe that the universe is super old or anything like that. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm as literal as possible with the Bible. But uh, I do believe that those first three days, there may have been more that happened. And remember, in, you know, we think of time as, time as, time as a physical property that bends and changes. It moves at different rates depending on where you are. <laughs> so, you know, that's not the point. The point is not the cosmology. The point is what is the principle? And the principle is that for anything to happen when there's judgment and darkness, when there's darkness and water and death, there needs to be dry ground. And for that, there needs to be light, you know. So God calls forth light, and he does that by speaking. And then he calls the, he separates the darkness from the light. So there needs to be a separation. And that's another thing you see in the first three days in creation is the principle of separation by the word. He separates dark from light, heaven from earth, dry from wet. And there needs to be that kind of separation in our life. And when he saves us and illuminates the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ in our heart, he begins a separating work. He separates us from our former life by crucifying us. He separates us from false professors in religion by washing us with the water of his word. In fact, it's a separation process that is always going on. The word is a two-edged sword. It is meant to divide. Hebrews says that the word is living and sharp and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide asunder soul and spirit and pierce even to the thoughts and intention of the heart. And he searches us. The word is a person who searches us. Nothing is hidden from the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And that's another reason why the doctrine is strewn through the Bible so that you have to search the word. On the one hand, you're searching the word. On the other hand, the word is searching you and revealing your motives and revealing what's of the old and what's of the new, you know. And uh, so there needs to be separation. And one of the reasons why Christians don't learn and don't grow is because they don't have that foundational understanding that separation is a good thing. Division is a good thing. Division is of God. See, they say, oh, well, there's a unity in the body, and so therefore we all need to be one. But the unity of the body is enjoyed in fellowship, which is a group of people who have been separated out by the word and divided from all the darkness and divided from discern the difference between the earth and the heavens and natural things and spiritual things and can discern spiritual things and for that reason have a fellowship that can build up the body of Christ. The oneness is a separated out oneness. It's not a general oneness. It's not unity for the sake of unity. It is not keeping the peace and letting darkness and light, heaven and earth, water and dry, all peacefully coexist. No, the word comes, and when the light comes, and when life comes, there's a separation. And the dry land eventually is separated. And if you want life to grow, and the herbs and the grass and everything to start coming forth and generating fruit bearing, you've got to be separate. And that doesn't mean not watching TV <laughs> or not dancing or not. No, it's not about that. We're in the world, but we're not of it. It is a separation of being renewed in the spirit of your mind by the entrance of his word, which gives light. The entrance of your word gives light and gives understanding. And that understanding changes the course of my life so that I'm going towards the new city of Jerusalem. I'm going towards Christ and everything I do. I'm growing in all things into him. And that's his life growing in me. That's what it means to partake of his life. I'm more and more being molded into him who is being fitted into me as he nourishes me as the tree of life of himself is his food. So overall, 
that is my view of Genesis 1. We didn't cover, I mean, the last thing I want to do is get into talking about all these minute details. At the end of the sixth day, he had created man, all right? And that was all his work. Uh, or, I'm sorry, at the, at, at the end of the sixth day, he was, yeah, he created man. We need to get to that. In the next section, we'll talk about that. We have to create, talk about the creation of man. After he made the beast, he said, let make man, let us make man in our image. Now, it's God here, okay? God is Elohim. It's a plural noun. Um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's a plural noun, God, Elohim, inferring the Godhead, the triune God. And in the Greek, I'm sorry, yeah, in the, in the Septuagint, uh, in the Hebrew, there's an Aleph and a Tav, untranslated, after, in the beginning, God. Aleph, Tav, created the heavens and the earth. And that Aleph and Tav is not translated into the translations. So they didn't make it into a word because it's not a word. It's just two characters. But if you look at an interlinear Bible where you can see the original Hebrew, you can see it sitting there. In the beginning, God, Aleph, Tav. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Tav is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which corresponds to the Alpha and the Omega in the Greek, the first and the last, which is who? Christ himself. I am the first and the last, the Almighty. Jesus Christ is the God of the Old Testament. Okay, He's the one who created everything. Yes, it is the triune God, but in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. And that's how God has always done it. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? He's the only begotten Son in the bosom of the Father. And everything God ever did was through him. Colossians says, He's the image of the invisible God. For by him all things were created, whether in heaven or on earth. And in him all things consist. He holds them all together. And he is the heir of all things. They were all created for him. They were created by him. They were created through him. They were created in him, they're held together in him, and they're created for him. <laughs> Jesus Christ is the subject of the Bible. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end of God's alphabet. He is the beginning and the end of everything God has to say. He is everything God has to say. He is the Word. He is God speaking. He is the light and he's the life. And it's God, Elohim, the triune God, said, let us make man in our image, plural, after our likeness, plural, but it's one God. It's one God in three persons, okay? Not three gods. They are they co-inhere and coexist. Uh, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit exist together as a unity. They cannot be separate, never have been, and it's always been that everything God does is in the Son through the Spirit. So God moved on the waters of the deep by the Spirit and then said, let there be light. That's how God moves. He moves by his spirit to release things into existence by speaking, right? So it's all, it's the father by the spirit in the son. Here we see in Genesis, uh, and then let them. So he said, let us make man, but then them, it's a plural man too. have dominion over the fish, over the fowl, over the cattle and over creeping, every creeping thing. That creates on the earth. So he gave him dominion over all the works of his hands. So God created man in his own image. And in the image of God he created him. I think it's images like three or four times there. Male and female he created them. So it's a singular man. But it's a plural man. Male and female. Just like God is. Let us make man in our own image. God said singular. Uh, it's a plural noun but it's used in a singular tense. God said it. And he creates man, plural and singular. Why? Because he's interested in fellowship. <laughs> what he wants is to multiply the fellowship. That's why John said, these things we write to you, that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. There's always been a plurality because there's always been the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and that's what God wants. And male and female, he created them when he created him. Everybody was created in Adam. Um... That's the principle is that, you know, you were individually thought of God, but you existed in Adam. That's why when he fell, you fell. That's why he, when he died, you died. When he sinned, you sinned. 
because we're in Adam and now we need to be in Christ. So he created the first human race in Adam and he created the second human race, the heavenly human race in Christ. So that's why in Christ is so important versus in Adam. And we need to see the doctrine of the two men in Romans 5. Because of one man's transgression, all of us died. Because of one man's obedience, all are made alive. And you're either in Adam or in Christ. And that's the difference between the old creation and the new creation, the flesh and the spirit. The old man and the new man. Is you're either in Adam or you're in Christ. And the only way to get into Christ is to be baptized into his death. And to die with him. And be crucified with him. Terminated. Put an end. Which God decided to do all the way back in Genesis 6, as we'll see. He already said he repented, he made them, and he judged them. But then he started calling people out, starting with Noah, to bring forth a new race and a new creation, and ultimately leading to Christ, who went through human living, death and resurrection, was clothed in incorruptibility, and came and breathed himself into the church to make them... Uh, born of this new incorruptible life that will eventually clothe them and fit them for a new corruptible, incorruptible heavens and an earth in which a new incorruptible city will come forth, the new city Jerusalem. Um, but here he's given them dominion over everything on the earth. It's an earthly dominion as a picture. First the natural, then the spiritual. First the earthly, then the heavenly. Uh, but what? imagine yourself as an angel watching this. As Lucifer watching this, he was inflamed, he was angry, he was jealous, he was with rage. Behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree which is uh, in which is the fruit of a yield tree yielding seed, it shall be for you for meat. And every beast and every fowl of the air, every creeping thing, he gave every green herb for meat, and it was so. Okay, then that's the end of the sixth day. Then he's gonna go on to the seventh day. And it looks like there's another creation of Adam and Eve, and that's not really it. I believe that it's just zooming in on, here's where he spoke everything, and so this is what it's going to be. And then he's zooming into it and setting man apart, and he begins his interactions with man. Not as God Elohim, but as Jehovah Elohim, it says the Lord God. And Jehovah is the, the pre, is is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ who walked with Adam in the cool of the day and had a human form, I believe. He appeared to Moses and spoke to him as a man. Jehovah, the God of the Old Testament, is Jesus Christ. And he said to the Pharisees, you know, uh, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. And they said, you're only 50 years old. How, or, you're not even 50 years old. How can Abraham have seen your day? He said, before Abraham was, I am. He told them he was the God of the Old Testament. He was the voice of the burning in the bu burning bush that said, I am, to Moses. And he is the man that appeared to Je uh, Abraham in Genesis 18 and had a meal with him. This is Jehovah. This is Jesus Christ. Jehovah Elohim. And he is the one that will interact with the Adam that he created in the garden in rest on the seventh day. So man starts on rest, really. God starts dealing with man in rest. Um, okay, well, to me this was edifying. Let's see what you guys think. Have a good day.